Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here and it's a great crowd. So congratulations to the amazing uh, Finnish chapter for a sold out event. Uh, it's in a row of uh, successful activities that the chapter has initiated in, uh, in Finland. And I would say Finland is one of the leading countries in service design, in education and in practice. And uh, you will see some of the examples of the milestones of the evolution of service design which are anchored here in Finland. So you're a big crowd and uh, I know that many of you are deep into service design. I know that there is a lot of um, experienced service designers here, but I assume that there is also some people who are more or less new to the field. So I see my role as the opening keynote to bridge the ones that are approaching the field of service design and give them a taste of what it is, but also not to bore, if possible, those that are uh, in service design that are professionals, so I'm trying to bridge the uh, two fields, give some background and also give some perspectives. Um, I'm teaching service design since 1994, and when I started I was pretty much alone. Uh, there was no other professors for service design and no agencies for service design yet. Uh, but of course there was already designers thinking about the changing role of design and how design has to adapt to the new challenges our society and our economy are facing. And when I did my first phase of research on what will service design be in the future, I stumbled over German design theorist uh, Lucius Burkhardt, who said, it is not the tram that makes the travel a successful experience, it is the schedule. And I love that little phrase, people who know me also know that I refer to it quite often because I think it really brings to the point the, the new challenges design is facing. No longer is it about the product, the color, the shape, the seats, the, uh, the material artifacts. It is about the system and that system does include, of course, often material artifacts, but it also includes the soft, soft components that we call services. So with this, Lucius Burkhardt had opened very early the discussion on how will design emerge into a changing economy and how is that economy changing? I think uh, all of you are aware uh, Professor Neely from the Cambridge Service Alliance has phrased it quite nicely. He says that we are moving from products to solutions, so we do not think about what are we producing, but what value are we creating, what problem are we solving. We are moving from output to outcome, so it's no longer about counting the pieces, uh, but it's about uh, seeing what have we achieved, what have we uh, made happen through the things that we have designed. Um, it is no longer about supplier um, transaction, it's about the relation, so it's not that people give money for a thing, but it's about building an ongoing relationship, an ongoing relationship that creates value for all involved partners, otherwise the relationship is no good. And last but not least, Neely says that it's about the change from su suppliers to networks, so in the new economy it is uh, about create co-creating value for users together with different types of stakeholders in systems. So this is kind of like a very short wrap up of the, the changes that we are facing in the economy. And uh, this is where exactly service design steps in and uh, brings design into these new systems of, uh, of relationships, of um, outcome, of solutions and networks. So the definition of service design that I have been working with for the last couple of years, uh, it's not the only one, there's uh, several definitions out there. I like mine, otherwise I wouldn't be using it. So I'm, <laughs> I say that service design choreographs uh, the different um, processes, technologies and interactions within complex systems in order to co-create value for relevant stakeholders uh, within these systems. So I like the definition because uh, it re refers to the choreography. For me, the choreography implies the beauty, the aesthetics of the solutions. Uh, so service design is functional. It provides, you know, relevant um, services for different stakeholders, but it should also be beautiful. It should be like a dance. If you go through a journey of a service system, it is something that, that we need to choreograph on the different channels so that the people feel that it is a smooth movement, it's elegant, it's beautiful. 
this definition also refers to the complex systems that I always underline. We are working as service designers with living systems uh, and we have to be respectful with these living systems because you cannot control them. You are not the master of uh, the universe. You cannot even you cannot say what will happen because these systems have their own dynamics and you need to refer to these dynamics, to the interrelationships and you need to find the right access point for having an impact on these systems. And last but not least, it's about the co-creation of value. It can be an economic value, but it can also be a social value, a cultural value, an ecological value. It's just that service design has to be aware of the type of value that is uh, aiming at uh, and has to be very clear about that. So for those of you that are newer to the field, I have picked a couple of milestones that for me indicate the, the successful evolution of service design and uh, one is of course uh, rooted in the UK. I mean, Andrea will probably be talking about that much more detailed later, um, maybe. Uh, but uh, for me that was kind of like a flash when in why is this making so much noise um, it was like a like a flash when in 2013 i read that the uk government has made the service design manual and that this service design manual uh, is the guideline for every digital solution that is being created in the uk government i got just said, wow that is amazing in 1994 i would never have dreamed to see service design on such a level 20 years later and in uh, 2014 it was implemented and uh, still today i think it plays a major role there is hundreds of service designers and design thinkers within the uk government making sure that digital solutions are created to fit the needs of people and to create value for the system instead of harassing people through uh, unfriendly and complicated processes so it's really a major, major milestone in the evolution of service design. I would like to mention a German milestone. Lufthansa has worked with uh, IDEO uh, between 2014 and uh, 16 on a service design project to create the five-star business class. Uh, and uh, what I find quite outstanding is that they had planned for a one-to-one -one prototype of a Boeing uh, in order to test two alternative service prototypes and I think that is amazing for me also when I saw the the pitch for that project by the way I applied and I failed um, too, too small and too cheap uh, anyway other story um, so uh, w when I saw the the documents for the pitch I was also flashed seeing how clearly they knew what they wanted they wanted the in-depth exploration phase the workshops with different stakeholders uh, they wanted the ideation phase with all the mm, visualizations of um, mock-ups and prototypes and the testing phase as I said one-to-one -one for three months in Frankfurt they tested two alternative concepts against each other iterating them while they were testing and then it uh, implementing them on the long distance flights. The third milestone that I would like to mention, ta-ta, ta-ta, uh, it was the first service design award given um, in 2015 and I don't know, I think it was a Finnish company, got it. can anybody help me? Uh, okay, it was a Finnish company who got the award, at that time still named Diagonal, uh, today Helen. Uh, they co-created uh, with different stakeholders of the health system a reduction of waiting time for breast cancer diagnosis by 90%. Uh, so after the project, women who were in that process of diagnosis would only have to wait seven days until they would get uh, the final result and uh, everybody can imagine what kind of value that brings to not only the women, of course, uh, who were afraid, who are worried uh, for a long time until they get their diagnosis, their results, but also for the system as a whole. It's much more rewarding to work as a doctor or as a nurse in a system where you feel that you are taking care of people instead of making their life difficult. Um, in 2016, a, a, a very big uh, project was awarded uh, and it shows that service design is also active in the retail space. It was a, a brand manual project who uh, worked with a former bookstore and created a chain of, let's say, entertainment. Uh, I think the economic profitability of that was amazing. Uh, I don't have the exact number in my head, but it was more than 100% increase in, in uh, revenue that they uh, created through that service design project. And the last 
last project I would like to share, just to give you a taste of the, the dif difference, the diversity of projects, is another award project. It's the Philips uh, Award. Philips in US worked with um, multiple chronic disease patients, and you can imagine that these patients are really suffering hard. Uh, they are only um, making up, I think, uh, 5% of the overall patients, but they are uh, producing 80% of the costs uh, in the health system. So it's not only it's a human suffering, it's also an economic challenge to deal with these multiple chronic diseases. And Philips co-created with uh, different actors within the system a platform uh, that uh, then reduced the um, costs by 32% and reduced the hospitalization of patients by 45%. So the whole system gave much more independence to the patient, uh, much better networking between the different, uh, different um, actors within the health system to build good solutions that are really ma mass -tailor, uh, no, uh, tailored for the, for, the, for the patient's needs. So just for, for a short taste of service design, uh, I think what all these projects have in common is that uh, they are bringing together interdisciplinary teams. None of these projects was designed by a service designer alone. It was always a co-creation with users and with representatives from different departments within organizations. And I think that is uh, one of the key components of service design to be working interdisciplinary, to work across the silos of an organization. Uh, all these projects, in a sense, have framed and reframed the, pro the, the, the problem. And I think that, that is a piece of art that uh, a service designer hopefully masters to not jump uh, on the problem as it is given by the, um, by the client, but to reframe that problem to look if the right questions are being asked or if we are putting band-aids on wooden legs, which is something we definitely do not want to do. So finding the right uh, questions through framing and reframing is something that was done in all these projects. Um, zooming in and zooming out, always seeing the big picture uh, and then zooming again into the details, but not forgetting the big picture. Because often we are focusing on small pieces of a system without seeing how the interdependence between these small pieces with the rest of the system is and so zooming in and zooming out is a big piece of work in these service design projects. Thinking in processes, understanding the journeys, uh, mapping the journeys uh, is an important part and it's all about people. No matter if you work on an IT uh, digital interface or if you work on a retail space, it is always in the end about the people who use the services and who are supposed to get a value out of these services. So taking the deep dive and co-creating, as I mentioned before, visualizing and prototyping in order to fail early. So not talking for ages and ages about something, but build it, test it, iterate it, um, implement it or you know, throw it away. But it's really really about doing and seeing and testing. Yeah, the iteration process. So in the last 20-some uh, years, uh, service design has evolved. When I started, it was really a lot about playful uh, experimentation. We were still very curious, how can you apply design to these immaterial services? There were no examples on how it could be done. Uh, so we... Uh, put the strong user focus into service design. It was all about the user. We developed many methods and we were really proud about our methods. I never forget our first uh, global conference in Amsterdam when everybody was showing their little storyboards and beautiful journey maps and we were so proud of the crafting of, of well, things uh, in service design. Uh, we came up with amazing concepts uh, and um, we often worked at that early time as external partners or consultants for uh, public or private uh, service pro providers. If I look at it today, I would say service design has evolved to take a much more strategic focus. It has arrived in the boardrooms and it's a, an overall cultural change that it often uh, initiates in organizations. Uh, we are not focused on the user alone, uh, but we are focused on the system, on the di different stakeholders within systems, because only then can you really cha make change happen. Uh, we are no longer so much focused on the methods. We are still proud if we can you know, visualize a complexity in a beautiful way, uh, but it's much more now about the mindset, about really understanding that it is about the humans, it is about the, the people in the system, and it is about uh, the way that uh, we focus on, on valuable solutions for them. 
uh, it's much more about implementation, so no longer is it enough to create a nice concept that then ends up in a drawer, but the challenge is to really roll the things out and best case measure the success. And very often now we see that it's about an internal capacity. So service design agencies sometimes are helping the big companies to set up their own service design innovation labs and supporting them in that process so that they are enabled and empowered to do service design themselves within the organization. So these are some thoughts about the, the evolution of service design. Um, now, where are we today? I'm just coming back from China. I was a guest of the World Industrial Design Conference, and on that conference, uh, the Service Design Network was awarded with the Top Innovator Award. I have the gold medal in my suitcase because I just touched down at 1 a.m. this morning from China. Um, yeah, in case you don't recognize me, that's me on stage no? with the gold medal that I took for the Service Design Network. Yeah, <laughs> for the network. <laughs> and. On, on stage should have also been uh, Anna Stenros because she was awarded uh, with the top innovator for the chief design officer of the city of Helsinki. Uh, unfortunately, she was not on stage and she cannot be here today. I will meet her for lunch today. Uh, she has also changed her role in the city, as most of you might know. But I was thinking, what does this mean? I mean, I'm not showing the picture only because of vanity, of course, also, but uh, uh, what, what does it mean that, that in China, the service design network is being awarded for being a top innovator network? And I think it really indicates very clearly the recognition that service design is achieving all over the world. It also shows that the service design network today is one of the key players within the global design organizations. So we are being invited for the World Design Conference. Jesse Grimes was there in Montreal last year. Uh, we are part of uh, different huge design lobbying organizations. And I think that is great uh, because now we can also intrude the politics and the funding for research uh, on, a, on a higher level. So service design is growing, it's growing very fast, uh, and that has some implications that I want to rush you through. Um, we need to improve education. We need to have more education, we need to have more universities that offer uh, qualified uh, programs in the BA and MA level and also PhD programs in service design. Uh, I'm now representing the services and network in the Cumulus. Some of you might know Cumulus. Uh, so this gives us access to more design universities to help them build service design programs all over the world. Um, I think we uh, are building a service design network academy to, to offer high-end qualification for uh, organizations. And the education also has to get better. Uh, I think there is a lack of transparency on what the different programs are offering, and uh, so I really hope that we can improve the, the transparency on qualification and quality. One step that we have taken as Service Design Network is the trainer accreditation. We have now accredited the first trainers in Finland, uh, and that is kind of like a badge that says this person is really into service design and not just putting a badge on uh, its shoulders uh, because they have read an article on service design and now claim they can teach it. And last but not least, um, service design education will be earlier in the whole process. Schools are now bringing service design and design thinking programs into elementary education. Um, and uh, one little example that was awarded last year in Madrid uh, was the service design award. It was a project that was done in a school where the student, the pupils became the service design researchers and creators. It is such an amazing little uh, project. You can see the video of it on the Services and Network website. Uh, it makes you really think that, that children are born service designers. They are curious, they are creative, and they love to do service design. So education is an important key, and as I said earlier, the implementation, it will take me one more minute, um, the implementation is key for the future of service design. We cannot no longer come up with concepts and there is a lot of stuff implemented as you have seen. In 2014 a student of mine, Lena Hammers, uh, who is now I think with Fjord, uh, if she hasn't changed, um, and she found that uh, most of the responsibility in the process is taken in the early phases and most designers do not necessarily feel that they are responsible in the last phase. I think that has to change. Um, and uh, Lena Hammers found that, uh, well, service designers focus too much on the user 
which is interesting, that if you want to implement, you have to better bond with the client, you have to better understand the client's needs, and you have to speak the language of the clients. And uh, she also found that designers evade economical aspects and that they have to stop doing that. Money is not bad. Money makes the world go round, also in service design. So the financial, the economic aspects have to be taken into consideration if we want to successfully implement. So another uh, PhD student from uh, Curitiba University in Brazil found that uh, only 3.4% of the methods that we have in service design focus on implementation. That's not a lot. And last but not least, a PhD student of mine who I just successfully had in her, in her defense uh, last week uh, did an, an analysis of what are the key success factors for implementation. And uh, she used uh, networking methods to then come up with the uh, key factors for successful implementation, which is a good compliance, the human-centered mindset, resources, uh, communication, and uh, the uh, maturity of the content. Uh, so these were some of the findings. I would say overall we can say that uh, in service design we need something like an iterative contracting because the success of implementation lies in the beginning. If you do not do a good contracting, implementation will become difficult. So since we often do not know in the beginning what will happen in the end, I call it an iterative uh, contracting that we need to learn and apply in order to successfully implement. We need to do flexible bonding, which means we need to be on the side of our client without sitting on his lap. Uh, we need to be flexible in criticizing and taking ex external perspective, but also taking, you know, uh, alliance with him. And last but not le least, I think there's a great opportunity to develop new methods and tools in the service design community that fill the gap at the end of the process. I think service design has a lot to contribute in that final phase and we need to uh, get that d done. So I said, I think for the future we need um, education more, better and earlier. We need uh, focus on implementation. We need to have an iterative uh, contracting. We need to have a flexible bonding with the client. We need to uh, develop new methods uh, that are focusing on the final phase of projects. But I think there's also new topics coming up, many of them. I just want to highlight one. Um, uh, with a master student of mine, he has worked on the question of smart, smart digital services and what role does service design play in this well world of um, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. I'm sure many of you have already uh, thought about that question. I really liked his approach. He has uh, developed a, a tool set that uh, starts with the basic idea that uh, non-human stakeholders are invited into our projects. So we could regard things as being non-human stakeholders that have their own say and that are objects that we can learn from. We have done a nice project together where we had an, um, a wheelchair as being an um, uh, active stakeholder. So the wheelchair uh, became, for example, um, his object persona. Uh, and it's really amazing to think about the objects in the context of your service in that way, that they are a persona, that they have a say in what they would like to do within that system. And a wheelchair saying that uh, he, he would love to be more helpful to his user in uh, navigating him or her uh, from one place to another, that the wheelchair would love to contribute more in a sense of um, being more useful in different uh, settings. So the object persona is a, a nice tool and um, we are just playing with it at this point. But basically we are aiming in this uh, project with Santiago Everchez Gonzalez to get the most of smartness out of the objects. The IoT produces a lot of dumb objects like smart uh, uh, egg uh, holders that can tell you the temperature of the egg. I mean, my God, who needs that? Um, but in service design, we do need to take these objects as stakeholders into our projects and we need to try to squeeze out most of the smartness as possible. So the, let's say, more dumb level of objects is that they are interactive. Uh, they, even, they get a bit smarter when they have an intentionality. If they have an autonomy that they can make their own decisions, then the objects are getting on the highest level. But in the best case, the, subjects, the objects have a social ability that supports the value that we want to 
to create through our services. So this is a bit of a playground that uh, we are opening up at the uh, Köln University, uh, trying to open uh, new ways of working with objects in the IoT. And I'm sure that this is something that uh, we will hear more about in the future. Um, so. Advertisement time, take your calendar. Uh, on 11th and 12th of October, I hope I see you in Dublin. <laughs> so, um, and uh, as uh, Tarja has already said, uh, we are a network of volunteers and all what has been developed throughout the last uh, 20 some years um, has been done uh, through uh, crazy, creative, smart, uh, motivated um, people uh, all over the world. Um, many of them are connected with us in the Service Design Network. Uh, as I said in the beginning, the Service Design Network Finland is one of the uh, chapter, is one of the strongest chapters um, in the world and uh, I think uh, they are very happy to embrace new energy, additional people because there are so many things that we could do and would want to do if we were uh, resourceful enough. So uh, talk to us if you want to join in and be part of this group. And for now, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.